Okay, uh, back to where we were. Uh, so there are no grand rounds next week because of the AAN meeting. The department's social event is Tuesday, 6 to 8.30 at the Slate by Hilton. Megan, did you set that up? Okay, so Tico had no idea. I'll tell Tico. Uh, Dr. Joel Morganlander is receiving the A.B. Baker Lifetime Teaching Award Monday, April 15th at the convention center and giving a lecture. So everyone who's there should try to be it. It's called Advanced Neurology Advanced Practice Provider Fellowships. So a uh, great honor for the department for Joel. Today is the M M Muslim Festival of Eid, which celebrates the end of Ramadan, celebrated with uh, a feast for family and friends, marking generosity and hospitality. So to all our Muslim friends, uh, congratulations. Coming events at Duke, I don't know how many of you go to the neurology website, but we worked hard on the calendar. If you go to our website and click calendar, it'll pop up what's going on. And today, thanks to who knows what, uh, slight, the Slicer Dicer meeting with Elijah is at 10 o'clock, I said today the 10th at 5 p.m. in the Massey Conference Room. So any of you interested in that should uh, check that out. All-star nominations to Tico. Here are our all-stars. I nominated Andrew for filling in for me for three weeks and for what he does in DEI. I don't know if any of you were there Saturday when he did career day for a second time in a row, but Andrew is a true all-star. Uh, Margaret Getz was nominated by Matt for outstanding work at Duke Raleigh. They all get coffee cups. Uh, I nominated Pam for the recent departmental APT uh, dinner, which was incredibly useful for all the junior faculty. Uh, Cheryl, who seems to be publishing like crazy, was in a review of critical care medicine, uh, looked at the importance of uh, staff and evaluations uh, to combat workforce violence, which is a new thing I'd never heard of when I was in training. Uh, just a little comment on phrases. I remember when COVID phrases were a big deal. There were all kinds of new phrases like the new normal, an abundance of caution, flat. Remember flattening the curve? Remember social distancing? Now those are all kind of accepted, but even the eclipse has its own phrase. Does anyone know what the eclipse phrase was? It's really beautiful. The path of totality. Who doesn't love that? And it turns out that the path to totality is also the name of the band Corns, like 12th album. They were way ahead of their time, featuring such great singles as Get Up, Narcissistic Cannibal, Way Too Far, and Chaos Lives in Everything. So who would have known that Corn could predict the path of totality? I don't know how we're gonna use that phrase in daily life, but it's a hell of a, hell of a phrase. Oh, for all the division directors, annual faculty reviews are due June 15th or before that. And I think a two thumbs up is a perfectly good review, right? Nothing wrong with that. Those are kind of my reviews. This is today's CME code, FETSUF. And to introduce today's speaker is uh, uh, Dylan Ryan. All right, my friend. It was 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> I could. I was trying to figure out as I walked in how would I remember. So it would be Matt Dillon, but that's his last name, so that it wouldn't is, work. Yeah. And I remember you'd be opposite of Matt Dillon. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> he spells it differently too. Um, hey everybody, I'm all dressed up, not in pajamas today. Um, so I have the, the honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Max Hills. So Dr. Hills is a specialist in clinical neurophysiology, uh, neuro, neurological intensive care medicine and disorders of the autonomic nervous system. He was professor of neurology, medicine and psychiatry at New York University, chair in autonomic neurology at the Institute of Neurology, Queen Square in London in the United Kingdom. And until 2019, professor of neurology, at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, Germany. Since 2015, he has also served as adjunct professor of neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and holds honorary professorships at the University of Transylvania in Brazov, Romania and the University of Zhengzhou, China. He has chaired a number 
of societies and groups uh, internationally and domestically looking at disorders of the autonomic nervous system. Um, he has helped authored several guidelines on things like syncope, orthostatic hypotension, supine hypertension, and diabetic neuropathy, and has contributed more than 360 published works, including original research, review articles, and book chapters. Professor Hill is interested in the peripheral and central autonomic nervous system disorders, particularly those with a genetic origin, um, such as familial amyloid polyneuropathy, Fabre disease, and Riley Day syndrome. He is a member of the Brain Heart Task Force within the World Stroke Organization, and particularly is interested in autonomic complications of stroke and other central nervous system disorders, such as multiple sclerosis. He's mentored more than 50 doctoral students and fellows from many different countries, including Germany and the United States, uh, during his work uh, both in Germany and while he was in New York, and feels committed to teaching uh, his younger colleagues um, and supporting their uh, original research uh, through mentorship. Um, it's really an honor to have uh, met him, and I'm very excited to hear his uh, talk today. Thank you. Can you help me yeah. get to the, so this should be the lecture, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the kind words in the introduction. I'll try to, so you have to buckle up. This is going to be a quick ride through the central autonomic nervous system. When we go to medical school, we learn either nothing about the autonomic nervous system or very little. I have nothing to disclose, by the way. Um, what we learned is going back a hundred years. Uh, this is a graph from uh, Ludwig Miller, who in 1920 published the first book on uh, uh, one of the first books on the autonomic nervous system, basically together in the same year, Langley published a similar book. And we only knew about the peripheral autonomic nervous system, but the central autonomic nervous system, of course, mediates all impulses that are relevant. And this is taken from my friend Eduardo Benarish's wonderful book and shows some of the uh, master controllers of autonomic function, the insular cortex, the amygdala, the periparaventricular nuclei, the periaqueductal cray, and then of course a lot of structures in the brain stem. There are many more structures, the uh, frontal cortex, the anterior cingulate gyrus, uh, and there's a connection, of course the amygdala, and there's a connection to the hippocampus and the limbic system. Um, and what I, does that have to do with stroke? Of course, I'm very grateful to Wayne Fang that he invited me. And since he's a stroke expert, I'll focus uh, more or less on stroke. Every eight seconds, someone on this globe has a stroke. And most of these strokes occur in the middle cerebral artery territory. And there's the insular cortex and there are many connecting pathways. So even if you have smaller lesion, the risk is high that you hit one of these small uh, connecting fibers. And then of course, autonomic control is in disarray. How can we assess autonomic function with uh, uh, simple means? Well, there's the brain heart connection. And of course, you know, the sinus, uh, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. When you um, breathe out, heart rate slows down. Why is that? That's due to parasympathetic activity, but there is still an underlying activity. So when you compress the signal, as it's seen here for heart rate and blood pressure, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, the boom, 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 boom of the heart, which we're not interested in. We're not interested in the electrocardiographic signal itself, but in the distance from one R peak to the next. So when you Remove the pulsatile signal, you see very nicely the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, parasympathetic activity. We monitor respiratory frequency, we remove that, um, and we see the underlying so called Maya or M waves, which you probably know from cerebral spinal fluid pressure changes. They occur every 10 seconds and they reflect sympathetic activity. And when you remove those, you still have endocrine influences, uh, um, 
uh, you have uh, temperature influences, and we're not interested in that. So uh, here you see this, uh, the spectral analysis of the pulsatile signal on the right, and to that small little tiny square here, if you magnify that, that's not noise, but that's the respiratory sinus arrhythmia and the parasympathetic modulation. And on the left in red, the sympathetic activity. Is that really true? Well, when you immerse an arm in a, into ice water, this low frequency activity goes up tremendously. So this is what we used, for example, to test the interaction between stroke severity and disarray of autonomic function. You might say, what is this, 50 patients? We see thousands of patients every year, and he's talking about 50. We had to exclude all patients who have any uh, pre-existing condition that interferes with autonomic control, who were on any medication. Um, if you take a beta blocker, of course, uh, you uh, compromise autonomic control. So um, we ended up, we see 2,000 patients uh, at our department and via telemedicine and another uh, three or 4,000. But uh, um, we ended up to collect 50 patients who didn't have any other cause for autonomic dysfunction but the stroke. And we monitored a whole array of uh, parameters, including heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and many others, which I'm not going to mention and assessed a whole variety of cardiovascular autonomic parameters reflecting sympathetic and parasympathetic control. I'm not gonna read all those to you and we correlated these parameters with stroke severity as assessed by the NIH stroke scale. We saw a consistent, not very close, but a consistent correlation between the autonomic parameters between heart rate and stroke severity. Faster heart rate here expressed as RR, interval with more severe stroke, more sympathetic activity with more severe stroke, less parasympathetic activity with more severe stroke, and a loss in bariflex sensitivity. And all of these parameters, a loss in overall modulation, a decline in parasympathetic modulation and particularly bariflex sensitivity, and the increase, the, the predominance of sympathetic activity uh, in itself, each of these parameters, known parameters that increase the risk of fatal outcome of poor prognosis, of uh, um, a secondary stroke, of hemorrhages. So this is not good, to put it in brief words. You find the same changes, uh, for example, in many other diseases, for example, in traumatic brain injury. Actually, in the U.S., there is more than a million, 250,000 mild, mild uh, TBIs every year, and um, they are all at risk of a higher fatality rate. Uh, Teasdale, the neurosurgeon who developed the Glasgow Coma Scale, um, did a retrospective study and looked, no, a prospective study, and looked at the death rate um, in his uh, TBI patients over a period of seven years and compared that to the mortality in the Glasgow average population. And he found, it's easy to remember, um, over seven years, a seven times higher uh, mortality risk in the TBI patients than in the average Glasgow population. In the US, a large uh, scale studies uh, show increased uh, fatalities uh, with a risk that's probably two to three times higher than in the average population, but nobody so far has any clear explanation. Surprisingly, in uh, T-Stale's study, there was not even uh, after one year difference between the risk of mild TBI or moderate severe TBI. We think this is due to damage, to injury of the very complex uh, central autonomic network. Of course, even with a mild TBI, you have shear stress, you have compression of the brain, and that may uh, injure some fibers, and that can lead to subclinical autonomic dysfunction, which enhances the uh, risk of these patients. So again, why did we have such a small number for the same reason as in the stroke patients? Uh, we looked at patients who had a TBI uh, six months ago to up to three years ago, compared their 
findings to those of healthy controls. And we um, tested them under resting conditions, supine, and then we stood them up to activate the barrier reflex. So on the left, you see this circle in the lower left corner, corner which shows a nice uh, overall modulation and the modulation in the controls. And there is a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, sympathetic in red, parasympathetic in blue. In the patients, the modulation is much less and uh, there is a dominance of sympathetic activity, just like in the stroke patients. And the bioreflex sensitivity, which is a critical parameter for survival, is reduced with mild TBI half a year to up to three years after the trauma. So mild central autonomic dysfunction most likely accounts or contributes to the increased cardiovascular risk of TBI patients as it does in stroke patients. And uh, my friend Vladimir Hashinsky has very nicely uh, shown in a, a big review paper that with autonomic network lesions, you of course have autonomic imbalance and the risk of cardiac arrhythmias, and that gives rise to many consecutive problems. Now, every day you see patients who come with a stroke to the hospital, hemiparesis, and in, mostly it's a middle cerebral artery stroke. And then some patients a few days later complain about uh, chest pain, dyspnea, and you wonder why is that a myocardial infarction? And when you look at uh, the troponin levels, they're elevated and you may find electrocardiographic changes that are typical for a myocardial infarction. You could say, well, why does he have a myocardial infarction? Because it's a patient who has a vascular disease, he has a stroke, so he probably has, a, has similar problems at the level of the heart. That's not true. It's because of the central autonomic network, because of this interference with um, the autonomic network, the patients are at risk of stroke because uh, as you know, um, the insular cortex modulates so many parameters, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration, GI motility, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Vladimir Hashinsky even uh, coined the term the area of death, in case the insula is compromised, you have a high risk of unexpected fatality. Actually, uh, Luciano Sposato from, uh, from London, Ontario, and several others, including myself, we tried to put together uh, in an overview a few years ago in Czech, um, the array of cardiovascular complications after a stroke. And of course, uh, symptomatic or mostly asymptomatic increases in troponin are among the very frequent uh, effects of a stroke. Uh, that has already been shown by A and coworkers, for example, and many others um, 20 years or 18 years ago. Um, and surprisingly, they not only found in their patients um, 50 out of uh, almost 740, that there's an increase in troponin levels uh, a few days after the stroke, but it also very much depends on the location. It's the insula, and typically it was the right insula in almost 90%. Um, if you have a lesion there, then cardiac enzyme levels go up. And these patients, in most cases, do not have a coronary artery disease. It has nothing to do with arteriosclerosis of the coronaries. Quite often, of course, there are also all kinds of electrocardiographic changes in patients who before that didn't have any such changes. And uh, Luciano Sposato also showed that there can be atrial fibrillation first time occurring after the stroke. So um, I showed this uh, slide before, uh, in, on top of the troponin uh, increase, there can be electrocardiographic changes uh, that uh, indicate that there is a myocardial infarction. And only 18% of uh, uh, the patients who after an acute ischemic stroke have a myocardial infarction had a pre-existing coronary artery disease. So it has nothing, in, in most cases, nothing to do with a vascular problem at the level of the heart. 
Um, but most likely it is, or not most likely, uh, I'm convinced it is directly related to the interference with the autonomic network uh, caused by the stroke or uh, brain lesion of other uh, etiology. Now, uh, this uh, uh, image I owe to uh, Martin Samuels, um, who very nicely showed that when you have too much sympathetic activity, there's a risk not only of arrhythmia, but if it is very intense, you can have necrosis uh, in the myocardium, uh, contraction bent necrosis, coagulation, myocytolysis, and it is not related to the coronary arteries, but it is related to the innervation of the heart Basically, the tissue is burned by too much outflow of uh, noradrenaline. Moreover, you can, after a stroke, suddenly have heart failure or left uh, ventricular dysfunction. Uh, this of Steinschnitz group from uh, uh, Essen in Germany showed that if you do uh, intermittent uh, middle cerebral artery occlusion in rodents, this of course causes a stroke. And the larger the stroke, the more you lose left ventricular ejection. This is typical. It also occurs uh, with occlusion on the left side, but it is significant with occlusion, intermittent occlusion of the right middle cerebral artery territory. Ejection fraction is significantly lower, heart rate significantly higher. And on top of that, no epinephrine, epinephrine, and also cortisol um, um, are significantly too high after a right-sided uh, occlusion and uh, stroke. So this, of course, contributes to the cardiac dysfunction. Now, the uh, insular stroke that has, has been known for a long time can also cause uh, sudden deaths. Uh, Toku Tsukru in Stroke published this already uh, 26 years ago or 25 years ago. Uh, and he had uh, 62 patients with an MCA stroke and seven, that's more than 10% of these patients died within a week. Most of them again had a right insular stroke who had a left insular stroke. And um, had they probably interpreted the electrocardiogram, they saw that heart rate variability in these patients was reduced. So this is a premonitory sign. They should have uh, um, probably intervened early enough, um, but who cares about the autonomic nervous system? So um, Oppenheimer does, uh, out of uh, Vladimir Shinsky's group, he showed uh, years ago that uh, if you stimulate the insular cortex in a rodent, you can produce changes that not only increase uh, norepinephrine levels and uh, um, catecholamines in general and cause the typical electrocardiographic changes uh, resembling a uh, myocardial infarction, but he also showed in the animals that this really triggers uh, necrosis of the myocardium. But what all these data show is there is a difference between the left and the right hemisphere. So if you have a stroke on the left, the autonomic uh, sequelae are different from a stroke, uh, from those uh, after a stroke on the right side. And we used voxel-based lesion symptom mapping to better understand the hemispheric differences. So what you can see occurs not only at the level of the heart, but we looked at patients who had a middle cerebral artery stroke. And if the stroke occurred in the right insular opercular uh, region, the patients would develop diabetes. They didn't have any pre-diabetes before that, but many of these patients, uh, uh, if they had the typical lesion, uh, the insula is in charge of uh, all these regulations, they develop diabetes. Also, after a stroke, other functions like um, bladder function, erectile function are compromised. And we saw that uh, after a stroke, um, the number of patients having erectile dysfunction increased prominently, uh, was over 
if it was a middle cerebral artery stroke. Again, we wanted to know whether there is an association between the deterioration in erectile function and to the stroke location using voxel-based symptom lesion mapping. And we saw, again, it's primarily in the left insula, a stroke in the left insula, but also lesions in the right occipital lobe. They are associated with a loss in erectile function. We uh, did a similar study in women who suffered from or suffer from multiple sclerosis. And we were able to show with this technique that uh, left in the, uh, injury, tiny little lesions due to MS close to the left insula, I should say, hippocampal lesions, um, they are um, causing female sexual dysfunction so compromised arousal function, compromised lubrication. Now, why is there this difference? Ages ago, I did a study with uh, uh, Arnold Davinsky at NYU, um, who has a large epilepsy center. And many of the patients, of course, undergo epilepsy surgery. So before the epilepsy surgery, you know they have to have a VADA test um, to find out where is speech dominance, where is memory function. And they get a cerebral angiogram to assure there is no cross flow. Then you do one sided uh, um, injection of uh, sodium amobarbital to knock out one hemisphere. So you push up a catheter to the internal uh, carotid artery and inject uh, the anesthetic, and then uh, one side with this technique is basically sleeping. Well, and we did that in uh, 15 patients who were about to undergo um, tailored uh, resection uh, because of uh, um, treatment resistant temporal lobe epilepsy. So we monitored again a lot of parameters, but what did we see? When you inactivate the left hemisphere, you can see heart rate on the upper left panel before inactivation is rather low between 60 and uh, 70. And then after inactivation, heart rate accelerates. And when you look at the spectral analysis, uh, which uh, uh, the graphs I showed you initially, so you see here the um, peak that reflects mainly sympathetic activity increases tremendously uh, because only the right hemisphere is active. When you do the opposite and uh, you uh, knock out the right hemisphere, uh, then this sympathetic modulation goes down and you have more parasympathetic modulation. In most uh, studies we have done, we found increased sympathetic activity. And uh, that, of course, uh, matches well the findings of Oppenheimer or of uh, Martin Samuels who Oppenheimer, who showed that uh, lesion in the insula is associated with a burst in sympathetic activity that can destroy the heart. One of the main uh, modulators of sympathetic activity is the amygdala. You know that with uh, conditioned fear, uh, it upregulates blood pressure, heart rate, and of course, it's a master controller of many uh, autonomic functions. Uh, so what happens if you uh, activate the amygdala is an inhibition of the NTS of the nucleus of the solitary tract and a suppression of parasympathetic activity while uh, there's a direct uh, upregulation of outflow from the rostral, ventrolateral, medulla and too much sympathetic activity. So if you do epilepsy surgery, as we do it in Germany a few hundred years ago, and you do tailored resection and remove um, the amygdala, there must be an effect. You should expect that there is a decrease in sympathetic activity. And in fact, we monitored these patients before the surgery and after the surgery. And we did see that sympathetic activity goes down after surgery. So red is before surgery, blue is after the surgery. So sympathetic modulation of heart rate as well as blood pressure is much lower after the surgery and removal of the amygdala while parasympathetic activity suddenly is upregulated. 
in uh, epilepsy patients that is of course beneficial um, in many ways because uh, it reduces the risk of uh, tachyarrhythmias. As you know, there is a lockstep phenomenon. Um, Lathers and Schrader have shown in uh, cats, uh, in, uh, they had injected uh, pentatetratol in the cats that made them epileptic, and they recorded the discharge rate at the cortex and the firing rate at the heart. And there's a one-to-one -one transmission which they named the lockstep phenomenon. So that's why uh, in uh, uh, TLE patients, quite often you see actually in almost 100%, you see tachycardia. However, in very rare cases, cases you can also see bradycardia and even asystole. We looked at more than 800 patients who were video monitored. And out of these 800 patients, only five patients had asystoles, uh, one of the patients even up to uh, 30 uh, to, to 29 seconds. We tested whether this has anything to do with central dysfunction or is a peripheral problem. And in fact, we did a um, double spect effusion uh, was measured with a sesta spect and uh, the uptake of catecholamines, means the postganglionic uptake was measured with 123 iodine MIPG, which is an analog of uh, uh, norepinephrine. And what we saw in these patients who had the asystole was that their uptake rate of the MIPG was significantly lower than in the control and also lower than in other TLE patients who did not have any asystole. So this indicated that uh, this is a peripheral problem, not a central problem, um, which may contribute to sudden unexplained deaths in epilepsy. So loss of sympathetic activity is dangerous, but it is rare. Mostly there is too much sympathetic activity. And we wanted to know, is there a specific site that upregulates uh, sympathetic activity? And that again, we did in MS patients. So with uh, voxel-based uh, lesion symptom mapping, we were able to show that an increased sympathetic modulation of the heart is associated in MS patients with lesions in the left uh, insula cortic, uh, uxtracortical white matter. Uh, the MS patients typically don't have it directly in the cortex. And uh, same for blood pressure, typically lesions in the left insular region are associated with too much sympathetic uh, modulation of the blood pressure. And this disarray, this, this, this mismatch between sympathetic and parasympathetic activity, of course, also contributes to uh, stress uh, cardiomyopathy or stunning heart, uh, or as you know, it's called takotsubo according to the a Japanese name for an octopus strap. So it is ballooning of the apex, the base is narrow, uh, was first described in women. Um, typically when, when there is a stressful situation, um, but uh, the level of the stroke, when you, stroke patients have Takotsubo syndrome, the level of uh, catecholamines is so high that there is a, even a paradox effect. So epinephrine levels can, uh, if they're too high, they can cause negative inotropic effects, coronary spasm. Uh, and again, this typically occurs in insular stroke, uh, um, after an insular stroke. Of course, the uh, Takotsubo syndrome uh, fortunately, it doesn't occur that frequently in ischemic stroke, but it is rather frequent in subordinate hemorrhages. Uh, up to one quarter of the patients is at risk of uh, um, Takotsubo syndrome. And as you know, the mortality rate after Takotsubo in patients with Takotsubo is much higher than in stroke patients without Takotsubo. Uh, they, their status deteriorates and the prognosis uh, is of course also uh, bad, much worse than in other patients. Again, Martin Samuels clearly showed Takotsubo or stated is just the tip of an iceberg. And uh, this is a quote from Martin, uh, 
saying that the major problem lurks beneath and uh, compromises most visceral organs. So I'm not gonna read all of this to you. You know, it causes high blood pressure. It causes uh, uh, um, stress, causes uh, uh, stroke, um, psychiatric problems, depression, uh, burnout syndrome, and uh, um, even pseudo dementia, sexual dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, that's due to the fact that not only there is a, a high transmission rate of the high sympathetic tone onto the cardiovascular system, but onto all other organs. And this may give rise to uh, the already shown arrhythmias and to the damage at the level of the heart. And uh, as a result of an imbalance between too much sympathetic and too little parasympathetic modulation, there can be sudden deaths. After stroke, 5.5% of patients may suffer sudden cardiac deaths, uh, most frequently after, uh, after a hemorrhagic stroke or after a supernatural hemorrhage, and fortunately, uh, not so often after an acute ischemic stroke. So long story short, uh, chronic sympathetic hyperactivity may kill your patients either acutely or slowly. So you have to monitor autonomic uh, parameters because they're a very clear predictor of increased risk and you can intervene if you pick that up as I had pointed out in the paper uh, where the patients died within a week and uh, the authors had seen there is reduced heart rate variability. So perhaps some of these fatalities could have been avoided. I hope I didn't talk too long. Thank you very much. Well, I haven't studied that, but it's clear that uh, in encephalitis, for example, and in the encephalitis, uh, the patients have very prominent uh, autonomic problems with uh, high episodic fever, with seizures, with blood pressure going up and down like crazy. And uh, of course, when you control uh, the inflammation, this will go away unless the tissue is so badly compromised that there is a permanent lesion. But that's just, I'm speculating because I'm, uh, I don't know whether there's any literature on it. I'm not uh, aware of it and we haven't studied that. But we have, of course, an ICU had a lot of patients who had a sympathetic storm. And if you can manage to control that, uh, problem will be solved. If there are any uh, questions from the internet, uh, please feel free to ask. So in the room, right ahead. So the, the let me just so the internet. So the question is: Should people with a mild bumps and troponin with strokes get cardiac catheterizations? That's a very difficult question. Uh, <laughs> I think if you want to, our cardiologists do this one, two, three, and we always, uh, uh, whenever we see this, we always ask the, the cardiologist um, to decide. Not necessarily have. 
presentation, you also do project MRI. Uh, but mostly our technology. And the risk is just too high. But again, uh, as I said, it's the uh, myocardial function that occurs after the stroke. Of course, you could also have the other situation that you have a myocardial infarction first, and uh, then cardiac output is so low and the patient uh, uh, develops the stroke. But, but usually, if it's the other way around, uh, then it's not related to the pulmonary function. As I said, 18% of the pulmonary heart is not. Now, on the others, it's just burning of the tissue. That's why I showed the same slide. And I would add parenthetically, uh, Marty Samuels was a legendary person to folks of our age that passed this year. Yes. Um, wait. So Wayne is asking about the effect of modernity on uh, stress and heart and stroke risk. Commutes, Quite, uh, living in small little areas, no cattle, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, despite uh, these uh, dangerous uh, circumstances, the life expectancy decreases. Medicine gets better. But uh, certainly, all of the parameters we mentioned may compromise the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic function. And as I show, if you really have excessively high parasympathetic, as you could have it, for example, in the around Guillain-Barré syndrome, you have a very rapid switch between too much or too little sympathetic or parasympathetic. You can have a mix. Both is too low, both is too high, and it lasts only for a few seconds. Alan Roper has uh, published a case years ago where he very nicely showed that on the monitor you are, uh, the, patients, the blood pressure is so high that it's no longer visible on the monitor, and uh, you want to treat that. You better be careful because a few minutes later it's so low uh, that you have no more for a few minutes. So I, I think mostly it's uh, it's too much sympathetic. There are also, of course, causes of too much parasympathetic. And if someone is in depression, uh, there is a direct guy for the sake of time. I skipped that part because uh, I think we got for the lost time. You did a great job. And uh, so, but uh, Julian Sayer uh, from Ohio State University down in California, he very nicely showed that. He Depressed patients, um, or in patients who have a prefrontal cortex lesion, that is associated with the disinhibition of the prefrontal cortex by a vagal structures, inhibits the, uh, the rumbling uh, uh, amygdala. They want to, they're wild. So if they are let loose, you have very high sympathetic output. You have dangerous people. And uh, I just can recommend uh, to relax, to learn how to relax, and then you can cope with a long commute and stressful. I have a lecture on stress, so next time <laughs> I can talk about that. Uh, with, uh, with high stress levels, you induce all of what I just mentioned. So I would, I would recommend, we have a few minutes that you talk about that. So I was just going to talk about you know, what's in the literature all the time now are these socioeconomic determinants of health. And uh, they're all talked about for the most part in terms of epigenetic changes. So how does your work impact on that? And what do you think of epigenetic changes versus just continuous cardiovascular changes? Well, I haven't done any work uh, on 
genetic changes, but uh, I think uh, that they definitely play a major role, and I am sure that they modify our baseline autonomic balance. Um, I guess many here in the room, uh, due to the circumstances of their profession, of their way you have to manage all the different uh, tasks and expectations, they constantly have a fairly high sympathetic tone. And when that happens, you also have a decrease in overall motivation. So increasing sympathetic tone is associated with a loss of autonomic motivation. And that is very dangerous. I cannot comment on, uh, on the effects of epigenetic changes because I simply don't know, but I can assure you uh, that someone, unless he is training like you every day, uh, then you have, of course, more parasympathetic. But if you're like me, I used to train when I was your age, and now I'm obese and uh, overweight, and uh, um, I just don't have the time. Now they have a shot for that. You don't have to exercise. You have to take a oh, shot. Oh, oh okay. that's a very good idea. Okay, can you write me a prescription? Yeah, yeah, no, very good. That's. I think that's a devastating development. But uh, in most cases, that's an epigenetic mistake <laughs> that you that you rely on on uh, a shot to get rid of of. Uh, Accumulated decline. Uh, accumulated decline. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I, I think it's very important. Uh, many universities now have established centers where they, they take care of um, burnout or of the, uh, you're, you're reaching a level which is close to burnout. And this is costly, but uh, after all, it improves, and also big companies do that. They have people who, who teach their staff how to relax, and it pays off. They're more productive, they're less stressed, and uh, after you have to put in some activation, funding, or energy, but then you get the result that people are more satisfied with their work and more productive, and they don't have uh, the risk of you know, it's, it's interesting that what you said, uh, this kind of constant sympathetic tone, it's interesting to think of exercise as an intermittent shock to the cardiovascular system that just kind of wakes it up a little bit rather than your muscles and stuff. Well, I think with exercise, of course, we did studies on uh, autonomic uh, control during stepwise increase, uh, 50 watt, 100 watt, uh, 200, 300, in healthy persons and also in patients. And of course, the overall modulation goes down. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the exercise itself has a training effect. Because if you exercise regularly, uh, that's probably now a little bit of a speculation, but I would say your system becomes more uh, resistant towards immediate stress because you, you have a much larger resting modulation. And uh, um, that is protective. But, so during training, of course, your modulation decreases. You don't modulate much. Uh, I, I try to explain to my students always with simple examples. So I thought of an old motorcycle. Under resting conditions, you hear the engine going boop, 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 boop. There's a lot of modulation. When you're racing at 200 kilometers uh, per hour on the German Autobahn, the engine just goes bzzz, not even hear the single beat anymore. And that's very similar with firing of the sympathetic uh, nervous system, which is firing very fast. During every diastole, you have sympathetic outflow. During systole, you don't. So those of us suffering from modernity would say, got to make money. I got a job. I mean, I, I'm not, I, I can't meditate or reduce my stress. My stress is how the system works. So what do you say to people like that? 
I tell you, I can teach you how to relax in a few minutes. And uh, then you do this every day. What do you like? You're talking about meditation or mindfulness? Something like that. Just that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, <laughs> Wayne, what do you think about meditation? You say what? The teaching us how to do it's, it's Do you have not, a video? It's, it's do you have like a website? I, I can show you a video, but not if the Zoom is on, because uh, it shows, <laughs> it, it shows uh, a patient who had an anxiety disorder, uh, and the EMS workers thought he has seizures because he was shaking all over the body, so they brought him to neurology, and during my uh, time as a uh, resident in uh, old-fashioned Germany, I had to do psychiatry, become a neurologist. So they brought him to me, and I didn't know what to do with him, so I taught him how to relax. And I think he, I, I showed you the video. Uh, he did very well within a short time. So how much a day, well, so a regimen, let's say you pick up, you like to breathe deep or think about the beach. It's a good idea. Uh, how many times a day, how long do you recommend? Well, that depends on the individual. If well, you're just, excessively, awful. if you're excessively stressed, you should do it uh, like like prayers five times a day. Actually, my friend Luciano Bernardi studied the effect of uh, praying the rosary or doing mantras, and he showed that this significantly increases parasympathetic modulation uh, because. Uh, um, it's always the same, even if with music, uh, we did studies uh, the effect of music on stroke, and uh, there are hemispheric differences, but with the proper music, you can increase parasympathetic modulation, which means you increase the overall modulation, and that is definitely uh, not a bad thing. I don't know to which extent it helps the patient, but it really has a significant in, uh, impact on the outcome, but it definitely doesn't have, uh, it, it's, it's, I would say it's a good thing. So you would say up to five times a day, how long per time? Three to five minutes, you know. It's a good shot. On poor blood pressure. Well, I'm healthy. Okay, I you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, there's a phenomenon called the John Henry phenomenon, named after the guy who tried to beat the machine that could put the railroad spikes in, and he did, but then he died. So that was bad. And it's a, it's about like what Wayne is talking about, the stresses of life and how that can actually have a significant impact. But I mean, for God's sakes, compared to the Middle Ages, the stresses of life now are nothing. Right? Yeah, but we're spoiled. <laughs> First of all, in the Middle Ages, probably at least water in the room would already be dead. Yeah, and the rest would be covered with leeches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, anyway, thank you very much.